I'm Linda Coberly and I am a seventh grade teacher at Sterling Middle School in Sterling, Colorado and I teach English and reading. Okay, I've been here um, at the middle school. This will be my, this is the end of my eighth year. And um, actually, um, I'm from the Denver area and my husband's parents own a business here, or did. And so we came back to help them and I was in banking at the time and when I was in, uh, in Denver, I worked in training um, adults on computers. And so once I got to Sterling and I was in banking still, um, I decided I really love training. So I decided what's the best, next best thing here in Sterling. And so that's why I went into teaching. I found out, I worked through, while I was working full time, then I, um, I was already, I already had a degree and I just had to get certified. So I got certified and then a job opening here and that's where I've been. Um, actually, um, I started, I piloted a program last year and now it's in all of seventh grade and we're trying to have it be in the eighth and the sixth grade as well. But um, it's small groups and it is really intimate and I really, really like that because I can actually see, as opposed to doing the whole group teaching that's been the way people have taught for a long time, um, you take a group of kids up to the front and um, Gram, whether I, I do it now with grammar, the program is for writing, but now I can see exactly what a child has a problem with. I can see that. When you do whole group, you just see kids looking around and they're going, oh, uh, I don't know, what are, what are we doing? But this way, I, I have a group of five and I can actually see what they can and can't do. And, and that is just, that, and, and then you kind of go off and go, oh, well, how are you doing? Or what are you doing this weekend? Or what did you do this last weekend? And so you get a little bit more intimate with the kids, and I really, really like that. And, and I think that, that sh I like the intimacy, and I like the fact that I can see where they're missing something, and then I can correct it right then. The one part about that that's kind of hard about the classroom, and older teachers probably don't, wouldn't like the, what my room looks like because the rest of the kids are having to work on their own and they aren't like you and I when we used to have to sit quietly and do our work. I mean, they, it's a global society and they're global kids. So they have to interact all the time and stuff. And so it, it makes for a noisy classroom, but, but I do. And I, that's really what I enjoy doing is that intimacy of seeing that, what, that I'm making a difference right that moment. So that's what I really like. Well, the biggest thing is probably um, supplies. Um, I buy my own um, whiteboard markers. Um, I notice that they don't, uh, they aren't buying more of the construction paper in all the colors like they used to. So I have to kind of supplement that in different ways or no longer use that kind of paper and just use white paper and markers and that kind of stuff. Um, that's small things. Although as a teacher, I think that we, constantly buy things anyway. Um, so it's not a huge difference just yet. And I'm in a position where um, the, using that extra money isn't a big deal. I know that some that are single teachers um, that, you know, they, they don't want to use their, or they can't use their money to um, supplement the classroom. Um, I don't have a problem with that right now, but I am two parents family and all that kind of thing. And we only have one child, so it's not a huge deal. Um, the way I see it moving in the future, though, is a little bit more scarier because they have cut everything that they could possibly cut without um, making too hard, too strong of an impact. But now, the way I see it now, because every year it's more money that they're taking away, um, it's the scariest thing I see coming up is um, our classroom sizes. Right now I have one that's fifth hour and it has 20, well, it started out 28 and as kids have moved away, but 28 and um, that is really hard to manage. And my other classes are pretty good to manage, but that's a lot of kids. And if they aren't going to, in our district, they're considering not hiring new teachers when ones retire. And so that means more kids in the classroom. And, and, and I think that the way that the state is requiring us to get all these kids proficient and growing, that, that's, I mean, they're wanting this, but then we're, we're having to have this many more kids, and that makes it that much more difficult to get what they need. So it's sort of a catch-22 situation. Yeah. So I have two classes. One is 28. This one is now down to 26. 
I have a class of 15, I have a class of um, 17, and a class of another class of about 17. Um, first of all, managing them is the is a big issue. Um, the class that I have, 26, is a writing class, and um, it is constantly behind. Whereas my class that has one class is 17, and that's what I would call a traditional student. I mean, they're they work well. They they ha they're probably proficient on everything just because they're what you would consider a traditional student class. Then I have an intervention class that's like 15 in there, and so they're they're difficult because they're they don't have all the skills. So you take a lot more time with them. If that got bigger, uh, then I would reach even less. Um, and then my 20, the one that has 26 in English, they, they're constantly behind my traditional students. I mean, they're probably a good week behind as far as the curriculum because of managing them, their behaviors, not just, it's not just teaching them skills of writing. It's teaching them behavior skills or trying to keep that behavior issue at bay so it doesn't interrupt. And it does interrupt. So. Does the behavior get worse in a bigger class? Yeah, um, I think so. And, and part of it is maybe just our district itself and how we handle things. Um, we have classes that have gifted, and then we have classes that are obviously for the intervention or kids that are below proficient. And so all the rest are funneled in. And because we only have a certain number of advanced classes and intervention classes, those other classes get large because they can only have so many in each of those other two classes. So that might be just an issue with um, our district. However, if they don't hire new teachers or by the ones that are retiring, then that only means then we're going to have to make all the classes larger. I think the, a lot of the mood of teachers is um, the issue with their pay. Um, I have never, personally, I have never been a, an, I've never had an issue with pay. I mean, I know I've been paid less at jobs and I did a lot of work and, and but I've never, um, and even when I was single, um, I, it was never an issue. I mean, I, I worked within my means and, and I didn't think, oh, well, I deserve more or anything like that. So it's not, the money is not, for me, is not an issue. I'm, granted, I don't want to lose 5% of my pay if I have to, but um, but I'm, I'm also willing to not take a raise because it's not, you know, it's not an issue for my family. Um, I do know it's an issue for a lot of people. They think that teachers are doing more for less. Um, but these, we're talking about people that this is all they've done. I've been out in the business world, so it's, these aren't the only skills I have. So I'm not, it's not that scary for me. But I suppose if you've been a teacher for 20 years and that's all you know, because you're in your 40s now and you started at 22 or something, then um, it seems like the, the whole pay, either no more pay or losing pay and having more stuff to do, more paperwork, less teaching. Um, that's, that's generally, I think, what the issue is. I would say, personally, I think probably our voices are not heard. I mean, they listen, but they don't hear. Does that make sense? That, or they hear but they don't listen, whichever way you want to look at that. Um, they're open to ideas, but I ultimately I think that any time they ask us what we think, they already have in mind what they are planning on doing, and so we don't. And, and maybe not every time they do, but they've done it so much that now everybody just, now everybody is just going, oh, well, they're asking us these questions, but, you know, nothing's happening now. So I don't know if they've always if they do that every time, but I, that's the general feeling I get from teachers is that we go through the motions, but they automatically have their answers anyway. You never know an industry unless you're in it. And maybe prior to my going into teaching, I'd be going, oh, yeah, they, they only have to work nine months and stuff. But once you're in the, once you're in the position, and again, I feel like because I've been out of, I, I'm, I haven't just taught, I feel like I maybe have a better idea because I've been out, out in the, um, the private sector, and I've been now in public school. So um, I think that probably teachers um, I, and myself, I think they don't know what they're talking about. And um, it's kind of like when they're talking about doing four-day weeks, that's something our district is talking about. 
I'm thinking, well, that's all fine and dandy, except that I already work seven days a week anyway, because I, my planning time, and for instance, this is my planning time, I'm not grading papers, and generally I'm not, because I have to get report this to somebody, or I've got a, kids ask me some questions, and I have to find those answers for them, and you know, my planning time is really still working, um, doing stuff for kids or the district. Um, I grade at home at night, you know, so now this program that I said that I just recently last year started um, actually has relieved me of some of that because my kids are not, I don't have a due date and then all hundred papers come to me on that same day. I, kids work at their own pace because I'm, I have what I call packets or they have um, on my board back there. I list all these things and every couple days I move those back, I move them up and some of it is just extra credit and some of it is actually scored stuff. And um, so I could have a student on the fifth thing already and I could have another student still working on the first thing. So that makes the load a lot easier. It does make it a little bit harder because I have like 10 things I have to grade but it's only like one class. I have two papers of that kind, and I have three of another kind. So, um, so that, that program has relieved me of that, oh, due dates and 100 papers. And, and so going back to the four-day work week, I'm still working seven days. It doesn't matter. I mean, I, I don't have enough time in my five days right now to do all that grading and planning and all that kind of stuff. So. To me, it, it, it might relieve the budget things, but it doesn't relieve me as a teacher much. In fact, it just now means that I'm going to be working an extra day at, you know, at home instead of here. What are the differences? Well, one of the biggest differences is, um, and I actually wanted this, so that's, that's okay, but when you're in the private sector, you, you have your work, and it stays, and you go home. So it, it's more compartmentalized in your head. But as a teacher, I'm always, I'm always a teacher, except maybe at my house or in my backyard. Um, because I go to Walmart and I, kids are going, hi, even kids I don't know. I know they're about the age of the kids here, but kids know me from every grade that I don't know. I might not know their name. I might, I might not even recognize them. But I'll always say, hi, like I know them. So I'm always constantly thinking and using, uh, when I'm watching TV or whatever, thinking of ways to incorporate that into my teaching about the world to the kids or why they need to write or where reading comes in or or how I could use like a titanic thing with or yeah just constantly looking for resources that you can use in the classroom to help in some way help kids in some way <laughs>